Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. Uh, welcome to St. Andrews. It's wonderful to gather together. Um, we have a, a wonderful, exciting day uh, where we can gather to uh, honor and serve Jesus together uh, and encourage one another um, and delight in some of the children who are part of our church and uh, look at God's word. And it's going to be a great morning. Um, so we're going to begin our time by singing. So please stand together as we sing our first song, Come People of the Risen King. Have a seat. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Damon, and I'm one of the ministers here at St Andrews. Uh, just a couple of things to let you know about as we kick off our service. Uh, if you need the bathrooms, they're sort of around the outside of the church there. And if you'd like to take advantage of the cry room, that's out through this little corridor here and to the right. Uh, Miles, you want to might want to head out there sometime soon. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Um, uh, Yes, uh, welcome. Welcome to you. Welcome if you're new or visiting with us this morning or if you're joining us online. We're glad you're able to join us uh, as we gather together today. A couple of uh, just quick announcements, things to let you know about life of our church at the moment. Uh, the first is that at session yesterday, uh, we uh, appointed a new session clerk. So Roger uh, has been faithfully serving us as an assessor elder from Willows for the last four-ish years. Uh, and uh, yesterday he was relieved of his duties, which is, I'm sure, a great relief for him. Uh, and Alistair is now our new session clerk. He's actually away today preaching uh, in the Burdekin 
at the Air Home Hill charge down there, which is, uh, I'm sure, a great delight for them. Um, but yeah, if, if you need to email the session clerk email, he'll be the one who first reads those, I guess. Uh, anyway, he's the session clerk if you need that. Um, this week is the last chance to get Nancy Guthrie books. Um, so Nancy Guthrie is coming in the middle of the year. Uh, if you'd like to get a book now, read through it, uh, and then maybe have some some twisty questions prepared for her. Um, now's the time to grab those. Um, last chance today, have a look at the little bookstall over there. Um, and you just sign up and then uh, Heather will put together an order and buy them later. Um, final announcement is the congregational meeting. Uh, so next week, 12 o'clock, we're having our annual congregational meeting here at church. Uh, so that'll be next week. Please come along to that. Uh, great time to hear about what's been happening in church over the last year. Um, uh, if you're not a member, you're still invited to come along uh, and to, to hear the reports and, and see what's been happening. Well, we're going to turn to the Lord in prayer now, uh, and Richard's going to come and lead us in that. Thanks, Richard. Good morning. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we come before you today to praise and worship you. You are the all-powerful creator of the universe and all in it. All things were made by you and all things are sustained by you. You alone are the ultimate authority and have the right to rule and judge all of creation. We praise you with the wonder that the mighty God of all cares for us and loves us. You're gracious, kind and merciful. And we praise and thank you that despite our failings, you've chosen to treat us with grace because of your great love for us. We confess that we've sinned against you by wanting to have things our own way. <coughs> Excuse me. Thinking that we know best how we should live our lives. We lord it over others and exercise authority over those in our charge, but you have told us to be their servants. Jesus set the example in that being God, he humbled himself and served us and made the ultimate sacrifice on our part. We show, he showed through the washing of his followers' feet that we must be humble. He showed us that we must heed the call of even the lowest among us. It is your example that we must follow. You are worthy of all praise and honor, and we are worthy of none. Yet we often behave with others that we are. Help us to be humble in the knowledge that all we are, all that we have is a gift from you. Help us to remember that you have saved us by your works, not ours, and that none of us are worthy. Help us to see that we are no better than our brothers and sisters. We ask for forgiveness of our pride and selfishness. We don't love others as we love ourselves. We don't love others selflessly with servants' hearts. Help us to live a life exampled by Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you love us, and we thank you that despite you knowing us completely and seeing our ongoing sinfulness and rebellion, you still love us. Thank you that you humbled yourself and came to live among us as a suffering servant. You showed us how to lead with humility and love. You showed us what selflessness is. We thank you for demonstrating your love for us in a real and tangible way by paying the price for our sins. Help us to humbly serve others even when we're leading them. We know that we can't fully comprehend what you've done for us, but we ask that we might grow in our appreciation and this would lead us to a humility that leads to a servant heart. You, that we might grow in our appreciation for you, for all you have done for us, and in doing so, inspired to serve you through the service of others around us and those we have authority over. We pray that, pray that we clearly see Jesus' mission and why he had to die and, what, and that we can always trust in him. We pray for our friends and family in the community around us uh, as, uh, in this lead-up time to Easter. We pray for those who know Jesus that they would be spurred on to trust him and those who don't know him would hear the good news and put their faith in him. Lord, we thank you for our church family and the opportunity we have to love and serve one another. We pray for those who need uh, your comforting hand, Margaret Petrovsky and Kevin Petrovsky Jr. We pray for Justine, Belinda, Hal, Jim, Edith, Denise, Jeff, Adele, Kevin, Margaret, Dawn and Gillian. We pray that you be with them and comfort them. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing. Uh, we, we give you thanks. If you just give me a few minutes.
Please grab a seat. Well, we're going to um, take a moment in our service now uh, to dedicate and welcome Hazel Wormsley as part of our church family. Uh, obviously, Hazel has been coming along since she was born uh, to Luke and Tamika, uh, and they've asked that we might spend some time welcoming her today. Uh, Luke and Tamika, they're really keen to raise Hazel to become a godly woman, uh, and they want to promise to do that. And we thought we'd take some time here uh, to welcome her to our church family uh, and to share with Luke and Tamika in their commitment to raise Hazel as a follower of Jesus today, to support them in that and to encourage them in that. Uh, so what we're doing now as Hazel's church family uh, is we're going we're gonna to thank God for Hazel uh, and for her life and her creation. Uh, Luke and Tamika are going to promise to bring up Hazel to follow Jesus and we're going to promise to support them in that, uh, to encourage Luke and Tamika in raising her, uh, to, model, to model good Christian morals for her and to teach her the Christian faith uh, as well. Uh, and, uh, but hopefully it's uh, not all just us encouraging Hazel. Hazel can actually encourage us as well in her simple and childlike faith. Uh, she can be an example and encouragement to us. We actually talked about that a little bit last week. In Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16, we read, uh, People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place their hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them and blessed them. We read that at church last week, didn't we? Uh, it's a privilege in, in a lot of ways for us to have children uh, here at church with us, have children like Hazel, who will be able to model what it looks like to be dependent as we try to live lives dependent upon Jesus. Uh, we also read in Deuteronomy chapter 6 uh, about Israel and how about they, uh, as they were about to enter the promised land. And, and God gave them this command, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk to them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. And so we're going to take the opportunity to commit to doing that uh, along with Luke and Tamika as they bring up Razel, uh, Hazel. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and we need to take this responsibility seriously as we do that. So I want to invite Luke and Tamika down the front now. Uh, I've got some microphones uh, and things here. Oh, I'm missing a... Hey guys, how you going? That's good. Oh, sorry. Yep. Press and hold. Hello. 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 What's that? Hey. How you going? Well, uh, Luke and Tamika, good to see you. Um, uh, while our kids are first and foremost, they're in God's hands, really. Uh, God gives them to us to look after and to care for and to bring up. And as parents, we've got to use the responsibility that we have, the time that we have with our children to glorify God before them. Um, so I just want to encourage you guys to keep working at maintaining your own personal relationship with God um, and, and encourage you to, to teach and model these truths of God for Hazel. Uh, I want to encourage you to, to live an authentic life of faith and to demonstrate the practical outworkings of the gospel in your lives. Uh, so in, in light of that, I'm going to ask you some questions now. Uh, two promises um, that you're going to do, uh, sorry, to promise that you're going to do that in your lives as you bring Hazel before God today. Well, Luke and Tamika, in bringing Hazel before the Lord among your uh, church family and friends, do you promise that by relying on God's grace with his help and together with us to teach Hazel about Jesus? We do. And do you also promise to bring her up to know what it means to follow Jesus by committing to constantly praying for her, teaching her the Bible, 
and setting her a godly example to follow. We do. do. And uh, this next promise is for the rest of us here to partner with Luke and Tamika. Uh, So will you, uh, as members of Luke and Tamika's church family, commit yourselves firstly to setting an example for Hazel and also will you encourage Hazel by setting a Christian example for her and teaching her about Jesus so that she can grow from a young child into a young woman of character and of commitment to Jesus. Well, that's a, that's a delight. Um, I want to pray for you guys. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for Hazel. Thank you that she is such a delight to Luke and to Mika and to their families and to all of us. Father, we pray that she would be delighted in you. We pray that she'd be delighted in you as you watch over her life. We pray that as she grows, you'd be with her each day of her life. As she grows, Lord, may she always trust in the Lord Jesus. May she know your wisdom and become like you in character so that she might show the world Jesus in the life that you've set out before her. Lord, please turn her heart toward you as she makes her way through this life. Lord, bless her and keep her. Make your face to shine upon her and be gracious to her and give her peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, guys. It's uh, it is a real delight to uh, to welcome Hazel and to encourage you guys in that, and uh, encouraging to hear you make those commitments. So, um, you guys wanted to grab a seat, and um, why don't we? Yeah. Well, um, maybe don't go too far uh, uh, because it's time for our kids' talk, and um, Felicity's going to come up as we do that. Let's go. (laughs) Hey guys, I'm Felicity, if we haven't met yet. How cool was that? I don't know if you realise this, but all the grown-ups here hope that you guys all love and follow Jesus. That's what we want and what we pray for. So it was really cool to see that happen today, wasn't it? Well, in Kids Bible Time this term... We have been looking at the big Bible story, the big picture of the Bible. The Bible is lots of different little stories. It seems like lots of different little stories, but they're all part of the big Bible story. We saw, first up, that God created everything. And he made it to be his people in his perfect place with him as their king. That's how things were meant to be. That's how things should be now, but... There was a big problem. The first two people rejected God. They sinned. And we keep doing the same thing. We reject God. We do things our way instead of letting him be king in our lives. It's a really big problem. It happens over and over and over and over in the Bible. People are just trying to get back to God's perfect place with God as their king. And God promises that that will happen one day. And he promised that he would send a rescuer to deal with that big problem of sin. A couple of weeks ago, we saw that that happened in a really unexpected way. God's people were waiting for somebody strong and powerful to come and make them a great nation again. But God actually sent a little baby, Jesus. Today, we are going to have a think about swaps when we go back out to kids Bible time and Will can you come up here because Will's going to help me for a moment come up here buddy thank you I have some Pokemon builders in here and Will I'm going to give you one okay all right here we go whoops got some dirt on him there you go who'd you get Pikachu Pikachu. are you happy with Pikachu do you want to maybe arrange a swap yeah all right how about I offer you who have I got here? Butterfree. That's Butterfree, isn't it? Yes. Would you like Butterfree? Yeah? How come you said yes to that swap? Because you think Pikachu is too famous. Because <laughs> you think Pikachu is too famous. Yeah. And you like Butterfree better. Yeah. Are you happy with Butterfree? No. Do you want to see what else I've got? <laughs> How about, would you swap Butterfree for uh, Ponytar? No, how come? She likes 
You like Butterfree better. Okay, what about if I offered you Oddish? Would you swap for Oddish? Yeah. Yes, why? Because Oddish is my favourite. Because Oddish is your favourite. Is he better than the others? You, you wouldn't swap Oddish back for any of these? No? no? Except Butterfree. <laughs> I like both of them. You like both of them? Is that, do you think they're better than the others? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Thanks for helping me. Okay. Um, people usually swap things for something better, don't they? Yeah. Will swapped for the Pokemon he thought were better. But when we go out to kids' Bible time, we're going to see that Jesus did a really big, important swap. That he didn't swap for something better. He swapped for something that was really rubbish <laughs> and awful. Yeah. But we're going to talk about why he did that when we go out to kids' Bible time. For now, let's talk to God. Let's pray. Show me how you pray. Awesome. Dear God, thank you for your love and for Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would help us to say no to sin. Thank you that if we're trusting in Jesus, you give us your spirit so that we have the power to say no. Thank you that you will change us to be more and more like Jesus. And one day we will get to be perfect in your perfect place with you as our king. Just how everything is meant to be. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to sing now. Can I trust you? Thank you. We're going to sing, we're going to sing The Lord is King. So can everybody please jump up and we're going to sing. Bible time. While we walk all the way out there, this is a great opportunity for you grown-ups to welcome visitors and say hello to one another.
Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see the 10.30 regular crew here. And I also notice there's a few 9.30 crew that were here before. And uh, there's a couple of new people here too. So for the new people, welcome to the White Cross Club at St Andrew. You're more than welcome. We look forward to having a cup of tea after and becoming uh, friends, not strangers. Today, I've been asked to, um, I've been given the privilege to serve the church by providing the reading, Mark 10, Paris 32 to 52. It's quite a long reading, but it's a really interesting reading, and I hope I, hope I can do it justice for you. Jesus foretells his death a third time. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking ahead of them and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and then deliver him to the Gentiles and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him and after three days he will rise. The request of James and John. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptised with the baptism which I am baptised? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptised, you will be baptised. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great amongst you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And they came to Jericho. As he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a great crowd, Barthemius, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, 
he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. And that endeth the reading for today. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, why don't you leave your Bibles open there? Um, and let's pray as we come to think about God's Word. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we um, thank you for the opportunity to consider your Word now. Please help us to put aside the distractions of this week, the stresses and challenges of life that threaten to stop us from listening to your Word. And help us to humbly sit below your Word, to hear it and to be changed by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, um, you might have noticed that I like the NRL by now. If you're new, you won't, but I'll, I'll let you know. I like uh, footy. And uh, one of the weird things that I like to do after I watch a game of footy is I like to watch the coaches' presser, that little press conference uh, after the game. I don't watch all of them, but particularly if my team was playing or it was an interesting game, I like to go and hear the coaches' perspective. But I reckon, having watched a fair number of these by now, that coaching a football team must be pretty frustrating. Any sort of sports coaching must be pretty frustrating. Um, the more of these presses you watch, the more you realise the coach's job must just be to say the same thing over and over and over again. It must be frustrating, but it must be important. It, it must be the way to get NRL players to actually get it. The way you get them to do something different after 60 minutes of a football game with exhaustion and fatigue is setting, them, setting in. How do you get them not to just fall back into old patterns? Well, you must have had to tell them, you know, a thousand times beforehand. It's true for footy, isn't it? Uh, but it's true for other things. Teachers talk a lot about how important repetition is. Parenting, I think, is a lot of repetition. And so is what we've seen at the start of our passage today. We see the most important message drilled home again. And even though we've actually heard this message a bunch of times, not just this last term, but for as long as you've been coming to church, you've probably heard this same message. It's actually exactly what we need to hear because we're so good at forgetting it. It's this message of the cross, that Jesus came to die on the cross and to rise three days later so that we might be saved and that we might be with him forever. Well, if you've got your Bibles there, uh, why don't you open it back up to that part of Mark chapter 10, And we're going to start in verse 32. And the first thing we're going to see is that Jesus' disciples need him to die for them because they care more about their own glory than about serving others. I'm reading from verse 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to teach them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Here for the third time in just two chapters, Jesus teaches again about his mission. He gathers the disciples and he tells them he's on his way up to Jerusalem. Not for conquest, but to die and rise again. If you've been with us over this term, you'll hopefully know why. Because we're not good enough for God's kingdom. We cannot make it into God's kingdom on our own strength or goodness or merit. We need Jesus to die for us, to take our punishment. And then he's raised to life again as God's forever king. And he invites us into his kingdom through faith in him, through trusting in him. You see, the disciples, at the start of this section, they'd figured out Jesus' identity as God's promised king, the Christ, the Messiah. But they still haven't got their heads around his mission. They still haven't got their heads around what Jesus came to do, nor around the way that God's kingdom turns our value systems upside down. And that's really clear because of what James and John do right immediately after this. As soon as Jesus tells them this, what do they do? Look at verse 35. And James and John, 
the sons of Zebedee came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do whatever, do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant to us, sorry, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in glory. If you're sitting here and thinking to yourself again, uh, I'm right there with you. The disciples are way off base. Again, this has happened over and over in the last two chapters. Jesus says, as your king, I am going to go and die and rise again. And James and John, well, they're thinking about themselves. Perhaps if we get in early, we can get the, the best seats of glory. Perhaps if we get in early, we can get some authority. I think they know what they're doing is a bit dodgy. Um, I don't know if you noticed, because they don't come out and just ask for it, do they? They ask, first of all, for a blank check. Over and over, the disciples have sought glory for themselves as Jesus has taught them that he's on about service, that they should imitate him as he serves them by dying for them. They ought to imitate him and serve others. But they don't, they still don't get it. Take a look at the way Jesus responds from verse 38. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. It is for those for whom it has been prepared. Jesus immediately points out that they want glory, but they don't realize that they're suffering on the way to glory. Jesus asks them, are you willing to drink the cup that I, he drinks or to be baptized with the baptism with which he's baptized? Now, the cup in the Old Testament is usually a sign of judgment. It represents God's judgment. And baptism here, it seems to be a reference to the way Jesus was baptised in solidarity with humanity uh, in, in, to demonstrate his willingness to bear our judgment before God. It's clear Jesus is referencing his death, the death that he's just told them about. This is what I'm going to do. We want glory. Are you prepared to, be, to drink the cup? Now, Jesus is going to glory. We saw that as well this term, but he's going to die to be raised again. He's going to die to take our sin, to serve us and to bring us forgiveness. Now, the correct answer is that James and John, they actually can't drink the drink that Jesus, the cup that Jesus is going to drink. They cannot endure God's judgment. That's exactly why Jesus is going to the cross for them but they will endure suffering on the way to glory. Just as Jesus goes through the cross to be raised and then eternally glorified, James and John, they will suffer. As they follow Jesus, as they associate with him, they will suffer on their way to glory with him as well. Jesus here says that they will drink his cup. Not the cup that pays for the sin of the world, but the cup of, suff the cup of suffering and even death on the path to glory. And this is true for all disciples. Opting into following Jesus isn't opting into a suffering-free life. Opting into following Jesus is opting into suffering like him. Suffering for the sake of others, in service of others. To put them before ourselves. Now, even though James and John, they didn't get the answer they were hoping for, I don't think... Uh, but even so, the rest of the disciples, they were still pretty upset. They were uh, annoyed and indignant with them. And yet Jesus takes this whole situation and he uses it to teach them about what leadership should look like in his kingdom. Take a look with me now from verse 42. And when the ten heard it, they, became, uh, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know, that, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be servant, must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life 
as a ransom for many. Here, Jesus calls the disciples together and teaches them what leadership and authority is meant to look like in his kingdom and among his people. The Gentiles lord it over one another. Their great ones exercise their authority. They make sure that they get what they deserve. They, get, they, they enact their rights. They've got authority. They make sure they use it. They push others down in the process of, uh, of ensuring and using their power. Not so among you, Jesus says. Those who are great in God's kingdom must be servants. Those who are first are to be last. And this is modelled on Jesus. Jesus, even the Son of Man, he came to die and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to serve and sacrifice for the sake of his people. And so disciples of Jesus are to take on a posture of service and uh, to the people around them. Where to take on a posture of service because Jesus took on the posture of a servant. Now, this is really important. Jesus doesn't just call us to a new set of rules after saving us. He calls us to a new way of life that is modelled on the king himself. The disciples are still struggling to get it. They know that Jesus is king, but they don't get that Jesus as king needs to die for them. And they don't get it precisely because they're self-centred and self-interested. And it's that very self-centred self-interest that's blinding them from understanding that Jesus needs to die for them. And it's a stark contrast to what those who are part of God's kingdom should be like, seeking to serve others in response to what Jesus has done for them. Uh, We had a local election here yesterday. Um, I was... uh, I was thinking about how politicians ought to be. I think in my sort of ideal picture of politicians, they're servants. They serve others. Uh, The word minister means servant. (laughs) They're meant to be serving others. Um, The people that they elected to represent, but they don't always do that, do they? I think politics, it can very quickly and easily turn into a chance for self-promotion. That's kind of like what's happening here. James and John are promoting themselves rather than serving others. And it just demonstrates how they still don't understand Jesus' mission and it demonstrates why Jesus' death and resurrection is so vital. It's exactly the reason why Jesus taught them about his death and resurrection for a third time. Because we're so quick to forget, to think that we're better than we are. It's exactly why they need to hear about the gospel again and again and again. Because we truly struggle to see just how deeply we need the gospel. I think we're just like James and John here, aren't we? We promote ourselves. We think we're better than we truly are. I wonder if you feel, uh, if you would feel the same if someone came and asked you, would you mind moving the chairs for something? Uh, Or if someone came and asked you, oh, would you mind joining the committee of management? Uh, Or would you mind joining the youth group leadership team? Would you feel the same or would you get that little bit of pride that you've been asked to some sort of uh, ministry with a bit of um, prestige. I think that's because we struggle to see the depth of our sin. The desperate need of just how much we need Jesus. I think if we truly understand just how much we need Jesus, then we wouldn't move on and we would seek to serve others rather than seeking to serve our own glory. There's another application here for us, and that's that when we do have authority or some sort of position of leadership in our lives, then we need to use that the way Jesus did. We need to use it in service of others for their sake. I think everyone, or almost everyone, will have some sort of leadership role at some point in their lives. Parents to your kids. Uh, the Bible tells older men to teach younger men. Um, so as long as you're older than someone, you have some sort of responsibility to lead someone. Uh, older women to teach younger women as well. There's some sort of leadership role that we all find ourselves in at some point. As one generation passes the gospel on to the next, wherever and whenever you find yourself in any sort of degree of leadership or authority, as followers of Jesus, we need to follow his example to sacrificially serve others and not to seek our own glory or our own good, but to 
to raise up those who we are serving. This is hard. I think it's really hard with your kids when they yell and they shout and it's late at night. It's hard with the next generation if they disrespect you or they, 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 they don't care about the things that you care about. It's hard. But it's exactly what Jesus did as he laid down his life for us. For his disciples who didn't understand his mission, who disrespected him, who cared about themselves rather than caring about the things that he cared about. Like other people. Like the little children that we saw last week and like the lowest and least in society. And in fact, we actually see an example of that happening in the very next section. Read on with me now from verse 46. Here we'll see the crowd push away someone who actually is a good model of discipleship for us. Read with me from verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Uh, here we see a man who is sidelined, literally sitting on the side of the road. He's blind. He's a beggar. He's an example of the lowest and the least in society. And so it makes sense that the crowd kind of tries to quiet him down and push him away. But he refuses to be sent away he knows who jesus is the son of david now that's that's an allusion to the fact that jesus is the christ the messiah it reminds us of how back in chapter 8 at the start of this section that we've been looking at peter declares that jesus is the christ peter gets jesus identity and this blind man gets jesus's identity now right back uh, at the start of this section in chapter 8, right before Peter declares that Jesus is the Christ, there's another healing of a blind man. In that case, it's a two-part healing. And in that healing, uh, and this healing, they sort of seem to form little bookends of this section of Mark's Gospel. And now in that two-part healing, in the middle of it, the man sees, but it's blurry, it's not clear. And then he's fully healed. And then immediately ap- afterwards, the disciples, well, they demonstrate their partial clarity they kind of get it but they don't fully get it they understand jesus identity but they don't get his mission this passage reminds us of what happened at the start of this section we're reminded that jesus is indeed the son of david the christ god's forever king and we're reminded of the disciples failures to see jesus mission over and over throughout this section we're reminded of how they're clouded how they're still blind They don't have the clarity that this blind man has. Well, here there's a blind man who has good insight. He's a man who's hopeless, outcast and low. He's not great in his own eyes. The disciples think they are great. He knows he simply needs help and mercy. And so he cries out to the son of David, have mercy on me. He's a man who doesn't see himself highly in his own eyes. And Jesus actually asks him the exact same question as he asked to James and John in the last little section. What do you want me to do for you? James and John say, we want glory. We want the exclusive left and right seat beside you in your glory. This man, he says, I want to be able to see. I want you to restore my sight. He just wants to be restored to full humanity. He wants to be a full, functioning, healthy human again. And where does he turn to find that? He turns to the Lord Jesus. He turns to Jesus' mercy to find healing and full humanity. And he's healed. The Greek word in the original here, uh, it means healed, but it is also the same word as is used for saved. It means healed and it means saved. He's physically healed and I think he's spiritually restored to full humanity as well. He comes to Jesus in faith and Jesus saves him. He heals him. And so what does he do? He follows him on the way. 
He becomes a follower of Christ. Jesus says, go on your way. You're free to do whatever you would like to do. And what's he do? He follows Jesus on the way. He follows Jesus on his way to the cross, on the way to Jerusalem. I don't want to make too much of what it looks like for Bartimaeus to follow Jesus because we don't see. We don't, he doesn't actually show us what it looks like. But I think that's because Bartimaeus isn't a model of moral living. He's a model of faith. He's a model of us, people who need Jesus, people who cannot save ourselves, who are not great, people who need to come to Jesus in faith and follow him on the way. As this man receives his sight at the end of this section, I think we're meant to ask the question, do you see it yet? Do you see that you're just like this blind man, helpless but for Jesus, in need of his mercy, in need of his mission to die for us and to rise again? Do you see it? I think in Bartimaeus we're meant to see a model, a model of a man who sees who Jesus is as God's forever king, but also sees that Jesus is his only hope, who puts his faith in him and follows him on the way. At the start of... um. Uh, oh, I didn't flick over the slide. Sorry about that. Anyway, at the start of this term, um, I called this series Serving the Servant King. I think the title works. There's been uh, uh, quite a bit in these chapters about what it looks like for us to serve others in imitation of Jesus, the King who serves us by laying down his life for us. But I think what's really genius about the way that Mark has ended this kind of section here is that I don't think we can leave thinking that we're good enough because we're servants. <laughs> we can't leave thinking... Or my service is what gets me into the kingdom. We can't think thinking, thinking, I've gotten better at serving others, so maybe that makes me pretty good now. Maybe I deserve a little bit of glory. Uh, That'd be nice. Maybe I kind of deserve heaven a little bit more now. I think as we finish this section, Mark kind of forces us to see that we're just like the blind man, hopeless and in need of Jesus' healing, blind and in need of of help. And that's exactly what Jesus' mission is about. He came to die for us to provide that help. Jesus healed Bartimaeus' physical needs and then Bartimaeus followed him on the way to the cross where Jesus would lay down his life to pay for his sins. Where he laid down his life to pay for our sins to make us whole again through faith in him. Why don't we pray that we might turn to Jesus in faith? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are tempted to glory and to power. Lord, how foolish is that? We are hopeless without you. We aren't great. We are hopeless and helpless without Jesus. Like blind beggars, we have no way of saving ourselves. And so we're so glad to know that Jesus died for us. We're delighted to know that he has forgiven us our sins. Lord, as we come to him, as we trust in him and have faith in him, Please help us to live modelled lives on him, lives of service and sacrifice for the sake of others, just as he laid down his life for us. Please help us to lay down our lives for those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, respond to God's word by singing One My Heart, so please stand as we sing together.
joining us this morning. Um, it's the end of our formal time together. Um, let me just encourage you, just a quick quick announcement that I forgot to earlier. Our Easter services, Good Friday, 9 a.m. Uh, Easter Sunday, we'll have 9 a.m. and 10.30. So both our services on Sunday, but just the one on Friday. Let me just encourage you to uh, to chat to each other, encourage one another over morning tea. Uh, maybe particularly uh, encourage the Wormsleys uh, as they uh, this morning. That'd be really good. Um, I wanted to f- close with this uh, benediction from Numbers. Um, do you know what the difference between a benediction and a doxology is? A doxology is directed to God. The word means praise. So you know those ones that are like, to the God who be praise and glory and honor. Those are doxologies. These are benedictions. They're asking God for a blessing upon us. So let's, let's, uh, let's close with this benediction from Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Have a good week.